Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Silburn Show. And today, I've got a legal expert coming up on the show today. He was called to the bar in 1982. His professional career has involved a number of high-profile human rights cases, both here in the UK and internationally. His practice has involved representation of a wide range of clients and high-profile cases, from the Victoria Klimber case through to the Kamishbal employment case to appearances before the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, CTR. He also appeared at the European Court of Human Rights in Gregory and the United Kingdom. After spending many years at Tuxcore Chambers with Michael Mansfield QC, he moved to become a direct access practitioner, working on a selection of cases alongside his part-time judicial career and consultancy work. He has successfully run his private practice alongside his judicial appointments and his previous public duties as vice chair and independent member of the Metropolitan Police Authority. His practice at the bar has been complemented by the experience he has gained within the criminal justice system and the health service. His experience has included being an advisor to the former Attorney General, Lord Goldsmith QC, as well as Vice Chair and an independent member of the Metropolitan Police Authority from 2000 to 2008, and having been a member of Ealing, Hammersmith and Hounslow Health Authority from 1990 to 1968. He has chaired two public mental health homicide inquiries for the Department of Health that have been published as reports. He has also been involved in several inquests as counsel for the bereaved family. And finally, he has appeared regularly on national and international news current affairs channels such as BBC TV News, CNN, BBC Question Times, Sky News, BBC Newsnight and helped produce documentary program as a human rights barrister and as chair of the Society of Black Lawyers and also written for many newspapers. I met him in the early 1990s when I came to the UK as a student member of the Society of Black Lawyers and he was one of those friendly faces that helped inspire me. Welcome, Peter. How are you, sir? I'm fine, thank you. You know, Peter, I said Peter Herbert mm. and I know there's more to it. Peter Herbert, OBE. Mm -hmm. What's that, Peter? What's OBE? Well, it's a, an antiquated <laughs> British uh, relic from colonial times, yes. whereby they, they, it's part of the, um, what do they call it? The system of honorage, peerage, if yes. you like. Yes. But it's quite low down. It's an it's yes. order of the British Empire. So it's above an MBE, yes. but below a CBE. Yes. And apparently the next step is knighthood. So I'm not quite there yet. Yeah. So Peter, I know all of that. You know? But yeah. I was saying, Peter Herbert, OBE, mm -hmm. you know? Peter Herbert, the um, man who challenged the system. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it, because you've got lots of persons who actually who said they wouldn't accept this from the system. And the work that you've done is not that you're against the system, but you challenge the status quo. That is part of your hallmark. And some persons would say, but why would Peter accept OBE? Well, I think it was on the basis mm. that you can use this yes. for something. I mm. mean, I pay taxes. Yes. The people who don't accept it pay taxes. Yes. We're not revolutionaries. Yes. So it's not a recognition of the system is all perfect. In yes. fact, when I accepted it, I told Princess Anne that really you should ditch this empire stuff because you don't have one. Yes. Yes. And she, she replied that, uh, well, it's not really my decision. Uh -huh. So I said, oh, well, if you and your mum had a word with Parliament, I think we could change it. <laughs> Ah. And, 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 and so yeah. it was not the answer she expected, but I wasn't in awe of it. Mm. But as a legacy thing for the community, it's a yes. recognition of what I've, I suppose, personally achieved, yes. but in a sense, very much the struggle of everybody. So in a sense, it's a recognition that it has and will be and still is and will continue yeah. to be a struggle. And this mm. is one small footnote of it. Yeah. And, and also what you mentioned about its... Um, you know, it's part of the system, you pay tax, others pay tax. Mm. But also, by virtue of such, you're able to be in a position to say to the powers that be, and mm. come on, you mm. need to change this whole thing. So therefore, it also opened doors, isn't it? Well, it does, and it, it, it's um, more useful, I think, abroad than it is in the UK. But even okay. in the UK, when, yeah. when they're writing a disciplinary report as a judge on you, yeah. they recognise the fact, oh, 
he has an OBE, so he yeah. must have done something. <laughs> right, right. So, so it was quite interesting that, you know, in your, in your uh, worst moments, it comes to uh, prominence. Yes. It doesn't make a huge difference. Yes. But uh, I think going abroad, people do recognise that to mm. get anything out of this country, yes. an achievement is actually something. But I, 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 do, rec I do respect those mm. who say no. Mm -hmm. They are entitled to that view, and it has to be a personal decision. Yes. And, and so, yes, it, it, it's a way of... Uh, Possibly social control. Yes. It's a way, can be rather patronising. Mm -hmm. Certainly the term empire is very patronising because there isn't one. But there's an irony in that, in mm -hmm. the fact that the only people who don't realise they have an empire are the British. Yes. <laughs> so, so, and, so everybody else does. And the funny thing about the British is trying to get back their own um, independence. Yes, well, <laughs> but not too much because they don't want Parliament to decide on Brexit, really. Decide. So it's, it's, it's all, uh, there are many contradictions. Yes, yes. Yeah. But Peter, listen. Um, what are the, or is, the particular event or experience that inspired you to do law or enter into the legal fraternity? Uh, I would like to say it was something morally high. Yes. But it was probably because my dad put a lot of pressure on me and I was trying to think of a profession and it was from Sierra Leone, from West Africa. Mm. One of the few professions that I probably could do. Yes. There was teaching. I didn't feel I was made to be a teacher mm -hmm. and so a lawyer seemed to be have a bit of kudos to it yes and it didn't actually occur to me at all until several years later that it was actually a tool with which to help your people yes yes i mean <clears throat> i think there are many people who are a lot more visionary uh than i was at mm. 17 18 but i tried to get into oxford and failed and i sort of thought well i want to qualify as a solicitor i actually failed yeah. to be a solicitor yeah. And went to do the bar exams and passed those. Mm -hmm. And then, contrary to my expectations, yeah. actually quite enjoyed the sound of my own voice. But actually, it's very interesting because normally the, the bar is a bit, the solicitor, sorry, you said you pass the I bar. I passed the bar but failed the solicitor's exam. But that's, that's what I was saying. The solicitor mm -hmm. normally the easier one to pass, isn't well, it? Well, I didn't find it. It was all about accounting oh, yeah, and yeah, it was yeah, conveyancing yeah. and it yeah. was hard Billing work. And all those it was serious hard work. Yeah, yeah. And really, I was still, I had my mind back in being yeah. a student yeah. and all my friends were doing the bar and having a fantastic time in London, yes. whereas I was having to work in Guildford every hour God sent and I really didn't enjoy it. The, the interesting thing you mentioned about that as a lawyer and the way it can help your people, and we've got great um, leaders of the world, you know, we talk about Mandela, um, even in Jamaica, people like PJ Patterson, everybody seemed to have came from, studied in the UK in a way. Mm. in that legal way and they've gone back becoming um, politicians in all aspects mm. of the world. Is it that it opens the door based on the same thing as how you got the OBE which enters and opens the system and engage. It's also having the legal system of the same British system that one navigates. Um, I, I don't think actually any of those. It's <laughs> funny enough, it's, it's actually for me it was seeing the injustice. Yes. And I think reading Mandela's book, it is that eye-opener on injustice, mm -hmm. which you see blatantly before you yeah. in, at that time in magistrates' courts in South London. So you would see you know, a middle-aged black man on a charge of drinking while disqualified, and uh, he would get a 500, 600 pounds fine, mm -hmm. and some white man in the city would come and get half that, mm -hmm and sometimes be banned for the same amount of time because it was mandatory. Yeah. But the, the, I couldn't figure out what was going on and you saw it time after time after yeah. time um, to the extent that I eventually spoke out and it was in, uh, after the Handsworth disturbances yeah. mm -hmm. in 1985 and there was a defence campaign uh, led by the great Rudy Narayan, one mm -hmm. of the great sort of Guyanese pioneers yeah. of the civil rights movement here. And he started up the Society of Black Lawyers, and I went up as a very junior barrister with mm. my then girlfriend um, for support. Yes. And it was a young man called Akpabio mm. who had been convicted against all the weight of the evidence. Uh, he was a sprinter for the West Midlands, mm -hmm. and this very overweight police officer said he, he caught him running down the street. And I thought, I don't think so. And <laughs> caught him running down the street. That, yeah, I mean, literally ran after him and caught yeah. him. I was like, you know, anyway, the magistrates convicted him. And at that time, from the Hansworth uprising, whoever you were, black or white, you were going to prison immediately mm. for at least three months. Mm. And this young man had uh, eight O-levels. He had a place, I think, at university to do engineering. Mm. His mum had cancer. 
and his house had been enveloped. So it's one of those houses where it was actually built not by local people, yes. but it was built by a developer, renovated by a developer, and the profits went straight in and straight out of Hansworth mm. with no benefit for local people. So it was a typical story of yeah. hardship and poverty, um, but yet great hope. And so I, I said to him, you know, you're going to go to prison unless I tell these people they're going to send you to prison. Mm -hmm. And I work on the psychology of these wives, because I was mad. I was yeah. really angry for, on yeah. his behalf. But I said, it, it, the person who's going to be walking away today may, or may not be either of us, but it's mm -hmm. more likely that you will be going to prison. Yeah. So you have to give me that permission to say this, but it's my best, your best chance. Good chance, yeah. And uh, the magistrates were shocked. It was, I, I told them that they were sending everybody to prison. Mm -hmm. I told them that black people didn't believe that they had justice in these courts. Mm -hmm. And there were three white magistrates who'd never spent a day in Hansworth mm -hmm. to live or work or play or meet the people that they were sending to prison. Mm -hmm. And therefore, in a sense, it really was a sort of apartheid side justice. Yeah. And that went down like a lead balloon, but the, cr the court filled it with people. Mr. Akpabia was extremely brave. Yes. And they came back, they took half an hour to come back in. And they, and because I, I told them, you're not going to give him a community sentence. Mm. I said, that's the, the, the last thing you're going to do. The community sentence. Is yeah. a community sentence. Because you won't. Mm. Because that's what race, how racism operates. And they, they actually got caught like rabbits in the headlights. And he'd done nothing. I mean, yeah. he'd, he'd really, I think it was alle alle allegation he'd thrown a brick, which had landed yeah. on the pavement, yeah. hadn't hit anybody. So it was a minor public order offence. And they came back and they gave him community service. Right. For 200 hours. And they issued a statement afterwards, outside a court, that we treat our coloured people in Birmingham very fairly. Right. 1985, which said it all. So that was their way of actually um, trying to address something, but based on the challenge. Mm. Well, it was based on the challenge because the psychology of it was, yeah. if, you t if you tell a man what they're going to do, yeah. they generally don't do yeah. it. And, and <clears throat> it was, but the real courage came from him. Yeah. I remember his name and who he was. You know, as an 18-year-old man, that requires courage. Yes. It is easy for me to stay in standards as lawyer, but for him, that was courageous. Peter, do you see that as any similarity with Grenfell? Well, yes, it, it, tragically. You mm. know, um, many years later, um, we, I was like many people watching TV mm. on that fateful night. Yeah. And you see a horror unfolding before your eyes, an avoidable horror. Mm -hmm. And you wait, as many did, for the government response, and it's not there. Mm -hmm. And the, all they had was police officers on the streets, eventually. And local people saved local people. Mm -hmm. And local people helped local people. And people came from all over London Camping, and, and yeah. outside. Yeah. Um, but it was an appalling statement on the lack of help that yes. local and national government gave, which mm -hmm. resulted in the apology by the Prime Minister. And, and, interesting, and interesting, as well, you say that as well, because the lack of response, but also the fact that the Prime Minister also, well, well, we know the history. I mean, mm. it's like nothing really happened. Mm. And I think, and right now, you've got the judge who is there. Uh, I think you have been on record by saying that it doesn't represent doesn't know exactly what these persons... I think it's similar to what you say in Birmingham, Hansworth, whereby mm. they actually have an idea. Yes, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a tragedy, and I was involved in <coughs> race training with the judiciary in the early 90s, yeah. you know, and it's been known for many years that one of the fundamentals of justice anywhere is judges and magistrates and lay people should represent the people they sit in judgment mm -hmm. over. And mm -hmm. if they don't, they undermine the whole democracy. So for the government to appoint yes. another and the vast majority are mm -hmm. white male high court or retired high court judges, mm -hmm. that's, in a sense, that will ha almost inevitably happen. Yes. But then after that, you don't think it necessary to have diversity in your inquiry team, mm -hmm. which they didn't. You don't think it's necessary to appoint advisors mm -hmm. who are from diverse backgrounds who know mm -hmm. the community, not necessarily living in that community, yes, yes, yes. but there are hundreds of us up mm -hmm. and down the country who are, have expertise as architects, mm -hmm. as fire experts, as planning experts, mm -hmm. as lawyers, as, as uh, experts with chief executives in the local authority, 
like Lord Ousley, mm -hmm. and they're all ignored. And therefore, based on that time at that point with the judge and now with inquiry going, has there been any change? Because it's a sort of silence on the wall of Grenfell Has there been any change, any um, <coughs> dilution of the team? Uh, not really. They, they did a, a very tokenistic a last minute appointment of a mm -hmm. very, very junior mm -hmm. uh, Muslim female barrister who had the job to, in her own words, to be mm. the brown face at the table. Talking fact. Um, mm. which, which really is an, an insult. I mean, if you're not going to do it properly, don't do it at all. Mm. But the inquiry hasn't started um, formally. Mm. We will see. But yes. I think the local community is tired. Tired, yeah. It is <clears throat> traumatised. And the local authority are, in a sense, doing their best to negate the mm. anger and the general emotion and mm. passion that is quite rightly there, felt by all of the 80 families mm. and more who lost their friends and loved ones, but also there were just under a thousand people that were directly or indirectly affected. Yes. That's a huge number yes. um, to trample over their rights and their feelings and sensitivities. Mm. It's interesting what you say there, and it leads me back to the, the bit about the lack of diversity in the British court system because, and the judicial, um, what has been your somewhat experience um, and what do you think can be done to improve the representation of ethnic minorities in the British court system? Because it does play a part because as you say right there, well, it's on one hand that the system or the network bring in the so-called judge there and they bring in the Muslim lady, but is that there a need for more ethnic um, well, minority, or I hate to use the word ethnic minority, mm, um, mm, Peter. I really don't mm, like that. Yes, for, no, the, for no, the term, I understand. Or, for I the political yes, term. Yes, you know? yeah. Yeah. In, in the UK, I mean, people are still in a minority. Yeah. But of course there is. I mean, the David Lammy review, which yes. highlighted the appalling mm. disparity in, in sentencing uh, between African Caribbean, yeah. Asian people, and white defendants, mm. is symptomatic of that. And in a sense, you have a police force, which is still even for London, only has around about 8% of police officers mm. are from minority communities. It's a lot better than it was. Mm. Actually, they allow two black officers to patrol together these days. Right. You know, going to car, there's a time that not even that happened. Yeah. And it wasn't because of shortage of numbers. And in terms of judges and magistrates, there are around about 8% of all tribunal members are from minority communities. Mm. But given, say for instance, in immigration, you have 98% of people are people of color. Yeah. But yet 92% of the judges who sit in judgment are white. White, yeah. Uh, and th that, that cannot be right. Um, and so it is not just about numbers, but it's about mm. training. And so mm. you have a combination of factors, yeah. which means that a lack of confidence, which the David Lammy report said, mm. It largely drives minority defendants to plead not guilty and therefore miss out on the lesser penalties and therefore mm. say for instance if you're African Caribbean the chances of getting an immediate custodial yeah. sentence for a drugs offence is 240 percent more than wow. if you're white. Well that's very interesting because you, you kind of phrase or I don't know if you kind of phrase justice is neither colorblind nor is it equal and that was in your perspe mm. perspectives on the Lamy review. Hmm. Well, that was a quote taken from uh, Johnny Cochran, the okay. famous trial, late famous trial lawyer for O.J. Simpson, o. Simpson, who we invited over here, who came with uh, Milton Grimes in 1995, yeah. the yeah. lawyer for, for uh, Rodney King. Yeah. So, you know, they, they made a huge contribution to the struggle for justice, both mm. in the U.S. and here. And the similarities are the same. Mm. So one of the things we're fighting to achieve now is to write to the Home Secretary, Amber Rudd, and yeah. say, look, you have to have a task force. If you're going to drill down into disparity and disproportionality of sentencing and mm. bail decisions, our fundamental freedoms. Yes. We don't pay our taxes to go to prison more often or with less previous convictions mm. than if we're white. We don't go to pay our taxes or vote mm. to, for a justice system which delivers injustice. And, and this is a fundamental human mm. right. So those things are intrinsic to this democracy. And if you cannot achieve them, then mm. it is not a true democracy. Is there, is there a breakthrough? Is, do you see a breakthrough? I mean, there's been a struggle. You had the recent breakthrough with this case. Are you seeing break? Was that a breakthrough to say that we have seen a, there's a light which is shining, Peter? I hesitate because I drove up the Wellhole Road. Yeah. And the Wellhole Road is infamous for the murder of Stephen Lawrence. Yes. And so shining a light 
Yes, that was a breakthrough, yeah. but at a huge cost. And, you know, at the moment we have the cost of 21 young people who have been stabbed or shot. I think it's 22 now. 22. Think, yeah. And so, an awful, is there a breakthrough? It is two steps forward, one step back. So it's like calypso music, you dance in circle, you go forward and you go backwards. You go backwards. Thing. And yeah. I think it's a continual struggle. So, yes, the, the, we recently had a breakthrough in the Supreme Court whereby mm. they recognised that for disciplinary misconduct tribunals for police officers, yes. they are subject to the Equality Act because the European Directive of 2000 makes it mandatory that mm. you have to have a, a remedy for yeah. discrimination. And the internal tribunals were not a remedy because mm -hmm. they have no expertise in discrimination. Right, right. Similarly for judges and magistrates, I have several cases going against the Ministry of Justice at the moment. Mm. And those decisions will positively affect me because it means that the people who sit in judgment are not above the law themselves. Yeah. They have to answer to the Equality Act. Peter, when you find yourself um, on that road or on the other side, challenging the system which you are a part of, um, does one do, do one feel? But look at this this way. I break it down. You know when you have these whole um, things which are happening now with the the, 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 the sexual allegations against um, ministers, politicians, movie stars, or whatever like that. There's a saying that if you say anything, it will go against you, and it, you cannot rise. Do you believe that when one challenges the system, young person, young lawyers, it actually dampen their rise? I mean, it can, and there's no doubt about it. Yes. And, and the, the difficulty that women have had complaining of sexual harassment yeah. is, a, is a prime example of that. Yeah. They end up being the problem. I mean, you know, Monica Lewinsky doesn't have a career. Yeah. Bill Clinton continued to have a career. Yes. And yet she was not in the wrong, he was. Mm -hmm. So there are many examples littered throughout history mm. of women and minorities who have spoken out and who have actually paid the highest price themselves. Yeah. So I, I personally recognise that um, there is a cost often, yes. but you have to make a balance. You have to sometimes just stand on your principles yes. and to hell with the consequences, um, sadly. And, but it, yes, it does cross your mind that, put it this way, I don't think I'm going to have a future as a High Court judge, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I probably wouldn't have had one anyway. Yes, yes. So, you know, for my, my purpose, it's better to struggle and mm. win, and I want to win and mm. will win, but it will also make it easier for the next generation to come and get that place yes. and in exercise some, hopefully, mm -hmm. some level of consciousness yes. um, and give themselves some, some more room to manoeuvre, as those before me gave me room yes. to manoeuvre. But I think a lot of people felt that, as they did in America, that race was yesterday's story. Mm. It's done and we don't have to do anything more. The, the post-racial That's era. right, post-racial yes. era, mm. with have got an American president yes. who's uh, of African descent, mm. and therefore, what's your Everything problem? Is cool what's now. your problem? Yeah. You know, you look at the, the UK football team, look at the way we socialise. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on The Silburn Show, and uh, of course, what I'd like you to do is to like the videos, share the videos, and subscribe to the channel. Let people know about it, but the important thing is also to comment let us get your comment, let us get your views, so we can understand how to even please you better, ladies and gentlemen. So, as I said, share, like, subscribe. Ah, thank you, I saw you there. You subscribed and you shared. Thank you so much, see you next time. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm at the... I don't know where I'm at. <laughs> one of those smiling faces, I always smile, always smile. Yeah. Try to, try to, try to. <laughs> Actually, I've never seen Peter. I know he wants to get angry sometime in court. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. My name is Peter Herbert OBE. I've just appeared on the Silborn Show. I'd like you to look and subscribe and like the Silborn Show on YouTube.